everyone. Welcome to Data Umbrella webinar, um, also co-promoted um, with NYC Pi Ladies. I'm going to do a, a brief introduction and then turn it over to Emily for her presentation. Um, and then after that, what you could do is you can place any questions in the Q&A and um, at the end, uh, Emily will answer questions um, from them. Uh, just, and just a reminder to reiterate, this talk is being recorded. About me, um, I'm a statistician and data scientist. Um, I'm the founder of Data Brella, and I'm also an NYC Pi Ladies organizer. Uh, the mission of Data Umbrella is to provide a welcoming and educational space for underrepresented persons in the field of data science and machine learning. We welcome allies who support our cause. Um, our homepage is dataumbrella.org. Check it out. We're also on Twitter, and um, we are a volunteer-run organization, so any time spent organizing this event is all on volunteer time. Um, Pi Ladies is a global organization, and the New York City chapter um, is one of the one of the local chapters. Um, it's a group for Python ladies and gender minorities of all level. Um, check out our homepage. There is a very active Slack team that you can join, and um, it's a really great community. If you have questions on Python, um, um, it's really it's really um, I, I recommend joining that. Um, um, code of Conduct, we have a Code of Conduct. Um, we're dedicated to providing a professional harassment-free experience for everybody. Um, and uh, thank you for contributing to making this, you know, to fulfilling the mission of this group, which is to make it, make it an inclusive, friendly community for um, people who are underrepresented in data science. Um, at the Data Umbrella website, there are many resources available, and I've taken some screenshots about contributing to open source, about conferences, about other community groups, inclusive language, responsibility, social impact, so uh, please uh, check it out um, later. Um, for more upcoming events, uh, the best place to find out about upcoming events is on the Meetup page. So the best thing to do is to join the Meetup group. We do also post them on Twitter and LinkedIn as well, and Facebook. Uh, this talk is being recorded, and a copy of it will be uploaded to YouTube within the week. All right, so we're going to get started. And I'm going to turn it over to Emily. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm just going to start sharing my slides. OK. Great. Welcome. Thank you all again for joining me. I'm very excited to be here. I wanted to give a little bit of a background about where this talk came from. So this talk is title, same title as my book, uh, Build a Career in Data Science, uh, which is all about the non-technical uh, skills and knowledge you need to get started and succeed in a data science career. So if you haven't seen the book before, if you're interested after this talk and learning more, uh, you can get 40% off with the code MTPUMBRELLA20. I'll also show that at the end at datasidecareer.com. And that code's also good for 40% off everything on Manning, uh, which has a lot of technical books on you know, coding in Python or R or whatever kind of things you want to do. In this talk, I'm going to focus on the first six chapters of the book. So this covers uh, getting started with data science, what it is, the skills, and then some of the first steps about finding a data science job. All right, what is data science? I really like this definition from Cassie Kozakoff, which is that data science is a discipline of making data useful. I like this definition because it's pretty all encompassing, right? So folks can define data science as, oh, it's just, you know, machine learning. It's just, you know, this area. But I really do think that uh, just like you know, you might not say you're a professional writer, but all of us do writing as part of our jobs. Uh, many people besides just those who have the title data scientist can be doing data science. You might be familiar with this Venn diagram from Drew Conway, uh, which is where does data science fall? It's the intersection of these three skills uh, called like hacking skills, math and stats knowledge and substantive expertise. And we updated this a little bit for our book, although we didn't change much which is you know, the same three basic areas, programming databases, we call it domain knowledge instead, math and stats. 
But we also wanted to highlight uh, what are the areas of data science that are most associated with, you know, the intersections of these. So I'm going to talk more about uh, the difference between like analytics, machine learning, and decision science. But I wanted to make clear, so rather than a Venn diagram where you kind of either have it or you don't, that, you know, these are all levels, right? So you can have uh, some people could be, you know, come from a computer science background and have really in-depth programming uh, knowledge, whereas maybe some other people come from statistics and are really strong in that. So it's not an either or, there's a big range of skills that you can have. But what do you need to know to get that data scientist job? I do think that you really need just practically in terms of like the availability of positions to know either R or Python. And this is going to be your main language day in and day out for doing things like cleaning data, for making visualizations, for writing reports, so on and so forth. But a lot of that data you'll need to get from a SQL database where it's stored, and that's where SQL comes in. So SQL is a query language that fortunately, the basics of it, you can pick up pretty much in a weekend or less. Um, and then you can go from there as you need it. And finally, we have Git. And Git, if you're not familiar with it, is a version control system. And the reason you need this is twofold. One, again, just sort of practically, it's something that's very useful in the job. Because what it allows you to do is rather, if you've ever uh, like saved you know, Word files and you've been like, draft one, draft two, draft three, draft 10, because you wanted those old versions in case you needed something from them, Git basically does this for you. So rather than saving, every time you commit, it gives a snapshot of what your code looked like at that time. So if you ever need to go back to it, you can. There's a bunch of other benefits as well, but the second big one is it's a great collaboration tool. So GitHub is one of the places you can host uh, your code that you've saved with Git. And it's a way that many open source projects are done through GitHub. That's how you can contribute code or file issues. Uh, if you're working on a data science team, that's how you could collaborate on a project. So this is the third fundamental thing you need to know on the programming side. And I'll add here at the end, a lot of people ask like, well, what should I learn, R or Python? This is a tough question. My uh, first advice is Python is generally more common to see in job descriptions. So if you just want to go off like what's the most likely thing I'll have, it's probably Python. But R is more common in certain types of positions. So sometimes more analytics positions or people coming from academia. So it's worth it if you have an idea of what industry you want to work in in data science or what type of data science job to take a look at those job descriptions and see, do they say R? Do they say Python? Do they say both? And if it seems like, ah, it's kind of like either or, some of it is Python, some of it is R, you know, I would try out both of them and see what you like better. But I would definitely focus at the beginning on just getting uh, good at one of them rather than trying to get to a medium level in both. All right, so mathematics and statistics. I'm gonna break this down into a couple of parts. The first is knowing what techniques exist. So for example, if you're working at a company and they say, hey, I need to group customers together, you need to know that, oh, I should try clustering. That's a mathematical method that can make groups from this data. Well, then you need to know how to apply them. So how do you actually do a k-means clustering, for example, in R or Python? But finally, how do you choose which to try? So there are many clustering methods, uh, and rather than trying each one of them, you know, if you know something about the technique, if you know that what cases they work well in, what they don't work well in, you can narrow down pretty quickly and figure out, you know, what technique should I try? And also some of the intricacies of, do I have to, you know, normalize my data beforehand? You know, all these other things of understanding a bit under the hood how it works. Finally, domain knowledge. So I'm gonna take this diagram from Renee Teat on uh, to describe domain knowledge, which is a core job of most data scientists is to take a business question. For example, how can we split our customers into different groups to market to? and turn that into a data science question. So in this case, like the example I gave before, how can we run a clustering algorithm to segment customer data? Then you need to get the data science answer. So for example, your clustering found three distinct groups, but you can't stop there because that's not very helpful to the business. What they wanna hear is something like, hey, here are three types of customers, new, high spending, and commercial. For if you've been working, for example, with Kaggle uh, competitions, they start at the data science question, right? They start with here is a data set, you know, predict this thing. 
Um, but most of the time, you're not going to get something so clear cut. And you're going to have to work with the business stakeholder to try to figure out what are they actually trying to answer? What are they looking for? And things you need to do that successfully inc include good communication skills, empathy, and understanding your data, which is huge. So for example, where, where can you find your data? What are some assumptions? What are some edge cases? Uh, and this is where you'll probably see a lot of tweets about working with messy data. This is exactly about that because in the real world, uh, just data comes with, with so much mess. You don't know if you should go and try to find another data set. Does another one exist? Should you try to collect more data? So you're going to need to be making these types of decisions. All right, so that's a little bit about what data science is. What are some of the core skills you need to be a data scientist? Great, but how, how do you become one? And I'm actually going to say, all right, what is something I disagree with first, which is that there's something as a fake data scientist. So I pulled these uh, headlines, which is like, how can you spot a fake data scientist? 20 questions for a fake data scientist. I just think this is total BS gatekeeping. And to not let this dissuade you and to, to make you worry that, you know, maybe because you don't have a formal degree in data science or you did a boot camp or whatever, that you cannot be a real data scientist because you can. And looking at these must know lists, so these are like 20 things you need to know. Like, honestly, I don't know a lot of these, right? I, yeah, I learned Python once upon a time. I don't use it much anymore. I only worked with time series data seriously in a couple months ago. So you don't need to necessarily know all of these things. And I really like Renee Teet's tweet here, which is saying like, hey, look, here are some tools I use often, like SQL, Python, Tableau, uh, and Jupyter. But I never used R or neural networks or natural language processing. And you'd find people who say like, oh, that's absolutely fundamental to being data scientists. No, I really think the skills I laid out at the beginning, like you know, some programming, some math and stats, uh, you know, some domain knowledge and communication skills is really what you need to get started. And you learn the rest on, on the way. So if you have a project come up where you need to do analysis of text, you'll learn natural language processing or you'll learn image analysis or TensorFlow. But there are plenty of data science jobs where you don't need to use that. And it's, it doesn't make you less of a data scientist for not knowing it or not using it. In this talk, I'm gonna go through four ways that will help you find a data science job. The first is creating a portfolio. Then we have expanding your network, finding the right jobs, and tailoring your application. Creating a portfolio. So I define a portfolio as a public body of work that illustrates your data science skills. So how you can do that is one of two ways. This is a diagram from our book. So you can start with a data set that you find interesting and find a question to answer, or start with a question and find data related to it to make an analysis. So let's look at some examples. So a great place to find data sets is Tidy Tuesday. This is a weekly project. Um, it's was started in the R community, but these data sets are usually in CSV files. So you absolutely can just download them and work with them in Python. Uh, and as you can see, there's data sets on you know, Star Wars, on comic books, on bikes. And this has been going on for a couple of years now. So I can almost guarantee you're gonna find at least one data set in here that's interesting to you and worth exploring. And this is nice because it's, you know, it's relative. There's sometimes the data is still messy, but it's available and there's a, just, it comes with a description or a data dictionary. So it's a great place to get started. Another, ex and here we have some people who've, you know, done this. So this is someone sharing a visualization uh, that they made about anime and manga genres and someone looking at ages of tennis champions. So if you're looking for some inspiration, you can see these people share it on Twitter with the tidy Tuesday hashtag. So it's another reason to choose these data sets because let's say you explore it, you can then look, hey, what did other people who worked with this data set do? But you could also start with a question instead. So this is a blog post about Trump's tweets that started with <coughs> a tweet that came out which said every non-hyperbolic tweet is from iPhone, his staff, every hyperbolic one is from Android. But this was essentially an assumption from looking at some of the tweets and how they differed. So what Dave Robinson who wrote this post did is he decided to analyze it. So he did some sentiment analysis. So he saw, yes, in fact, the Android does have, you know, more words that are on the sadness scale or fear, or anger. And this actually was picked up um, by some news uh, outlets. 
And so what he actually did before the sentiment is he also showed, look, the pattern of the Android and the iPhone's tweets, these are clearly different, like how they quote tweet, when they tweet, so on. It definitely looks like these are different people. And we have seen Trump tweeting on his Android, so the other one must be the campaign staff. So in this case, there was a question. And so Dave went out and got used the Twitter API to get the uh, you know, backlog of tweets and to analyze those. So some tips on when you do a data science portfolio project. So, you know, what I've shown here is these are blog posts or tweets with it, which I definitely recommend. So after you do the analysis, share what you learned. And a great thing to include is some visualizations. So this is Jeff Cow, who at the time uh, that he did this project was a meta student, which is a boot camp that I also went to. And he's looking, he's using uh you know, natural language processing to find, to analyze these net neutrality comments to find that a lot of them, the pro repeal were likely faked. And I really love this visualization he chose because it might not be an obvious one, but what he's showing is, hey, look, I, I didn't find that there were identical, exactly identical uh, messages, but I found that there were pretty much identical structures. And so he does the colors here. So he shows one message is Americans as opposed to, the next one, individual citizens as opposed to, citizens rather than the SCC, you know, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, as opposed to Washington bureaucrats, so on and so forth. So I thought this was a really cool visualization and definitely think about how you can catch people's attention at the beginning. Next. Choose a topic you're excited about. So this is Miles Salmon uh, writing a blog post on whether Python users are more likely to get into Slytherin. Don't feel that you have to, uh, you know, pick a project or analyze something that you're like, oh, I'm like interested in finance. I guess I do finance data. Like, find something that you like. I, you know, one of my projects was about uh, Pokemon teams and what types I should have my Pokemon team because I was playing Pokemon and I wanted to know. Uh, so you know, it's less important what the topic is and much more the kind of skills that you can show as you did it. So for example, showing that you, you know, here's some code that you did. Hey, look, I can get users. I can write a function and get users from Twitter. I can do some, you know, data filtering. I can do this like map function and per so on and so forth. My third tip is limit your scope. Uh, I really like this quote from a blog post says, you know, perfections can be a real hurdle. Um, and next time I'm not going to wait so long to push something out. Because I think that last mile can be a big barrier of feeling like, oh, you know, I, I could do one more thing or, you know, what if my code isn't quite good enough? So try at the beginning, like, it's okay if you don't answer every question you have about a data set. Maybe say, hey, I'm going to try to answer this one question or I'm going to try to make this one visualization or I'm, you know, I want to do this project because I'll need to, you know, I'll have to get some data from the web. And so I'm just, you know, I'm just going to get the data and I'm going to publish how I got the data. I'm not going to worry about doing anything with it. And that's perfectly fine. And it's definitely better to have something out there than nothing. And on that point, this is inspired by uh, same Dave Robinson of Trump, his uh, R Studio keynote, which I definitely recommend watching, which is um, on the unreasonable effectiveness of public work. But basically, I used to think, all right, like an analysis, essentially, it's getting more valuable as I go, right? I have an idea, and then I get the data, and I clean it, I explore, and so on. And you know, this, uh, this is true from your own learning standpoint, like you are learning things along the way. But in terms of as part of your portfolio, as some work that you can show someone when you're applying for jobs, it really, you just need to get it out there. Work on your computer is so much less valuable than something that's on GitHub or a blog or Kaggle, just something public because it doesn't have to necessarily be you go and tweet about it, but something that if you're in a job interview, you could say, hey, go to this URL or put on your resume, here's where my projects are hosted so that someone can see it. And on that point, you know, this full process is getting it public by putting it on GitHub and then writing a blog post about it. So putting it on GitHub, I, this is an example from, as I mentioned, I went to Metis, my final project on data science freelancers. And the helpful thing when you're putting something on GitHub is to write a readme. So to help people understand, hey, what am I even looking at? So in this case, I said, uh, this is a project where I got information on 93,000 freelancers, 3,000 jobs currently, and here's how the repo is organized with these different scripts and what each one of them does. And uh, right, as I mentioned, this is also a good way if you haven't used Git or GitHub before to practice those skills. On the blogging side, well, where do you want to blog? There, you can go with something like Medium or WordPress, which has the advantage of being easy and quick to set up. You can get some organic traffic on Medium if people search, say, data science or the topic of your blog post. 
But on the other hand, there's less customizability and control. So for example, uh, I know Medium seems like more things would be going behind a paywall if they decide that's what they want all articles to do. You can't do anything about that. On the other hand, if you make your own website, you really do have all that control. So that's a big advantage. It's always gonna be free. It does take a little longer to set up, but there are more tools that make that easier. I actually think uh, with Fast AI also has a new tool uh, working from GitHub to publish a blog. Um, so I should add that here. And you may get stuck debugging issues. So I've definitely, I use Blogdown personally, which is an R package. I've gotten stuck occasionally, but overall, I like it because I'm in complete control. It works very well with R. And the other advantage of it is that uh, if you are someone who really wants to customize it, you're like, I want this exact font, I want this color scheme, I want this. There's a lot of themes that you can get um, pretty easily that you can then see, okay, uh, this uh, type of you know theme comes with these colorings, but then you can customize from there and the, you know, the sky is the limit. So some things you can blog about once you have your analysis. Well, of course you can explain it, right? So this is someone explaining their analysis from a Tidy Tuesday data set about the gender wage gap in Australia. You could teach a concept. So Julia Silke here is showing a uh, principal components analysis using Stack Overflow data. This is a great thing if you say just took a course on a statistical technique or machine learning, write a tutorial about it, show other people how to do it. Write the thing that you wish you had had at the beginning because it would have made learning it so much easier or you can share your experience. So in this case is a post on uh, our studio conference uh, from Daniela Vasquez who got a scholarship to go. And so if you attend a conference, if you go to a meetup talk that you really like, you can write about it. You can talk about what you enjoyed, if the talks were recorded uh, for a conference, say which ones you recommend going to and so on. You can also give advice. Uh, so this is a blog post from uh, the New York about the New York R Conference from Our Ladies New York City, which had some speaker experience and tips. Or my co-author Jacqueline Nolis about prioritizing data science work. So if you have been, say, working in the field or related field um, and you want to give advice, that's a great thing to write a blog post about. Um, and it may be faster than doing, say, a whole analysis because you might already have every all the advice you need in your head or think about the advice that people come to you for? How can you put that in a blog post and share with the world? So next, we're going to talk about expanding your network. This is Rachel Katman talking about the difference. Um, this is research from Kaggle about the different ways that people already employed the field, found their job versus those entering the field. And we see a big one about employed in the field is recruiters and friends, families, and colleagues, way more than those entering the field. And those are about your network. Those are about who do you know, uh, in case of friend and family and colleagues, but the recruiters also have personal relationship. So this is a really common way that people get jobs. How do you build it though? Well, you know, you're here tonight um, or this afternoon or in the, you know, in the, in the early morning for folks in certain time zones, going to a meetup. That is one of the advantages of COVID is that if you're in an area that is, you know, say maybe you're in a rural area or a small town, there weren't any meetups going on locally. Well, most meetups have moved online now and some of them are doing uh, networking stuff before and after, or you can, you know, maybe you can meet the speaker or other things like that. So see, especially for some smaller meetups, uh, you know, it, it, and if you are someone who say like, lives in Los Angeles and you hadn't been before to a Pi Ladies Los Angeles meetup, maybe think about going. Because even if it has to be virtual for a while, there's still people local. They're probably working at local companies and they can eventually help you out in your job search. I'm a big Twitter person, probably a little bit too much, but I will admit it definitely confused me at the beginning. How I use Twitter is in a couple ways. The first is ask for help. And with that, please use hashtags um, rather than adding a specific person, like adding Hadley Wickham. Like it's definitely understandable, but the hashtag is great because people follow the hashtag um, so they can retweet it, they can see about answering it. So even if you don't have many followers, this is a good way to get visibility and to get people uh, looking at your question. So in this case, I asked about globally setting a color scale for ggplot2 and I got an answer. And when I did, I wrote a follow-up tweet saying like, hey, thank you, know, thank you for this post on how to do that. So this is one thing you can use Twitter for. You can also live tweet talks. So pre-COVID times, this was me live tweeting uh, our studio conference and also a meetup. 
And I sort of do this in two ways. Like one is to take notes for myself of some of my big key takeaways, but the other is to share with people who didn't get to go to the meetup, like what I think that they could really learn and benefit from. So this is a nice way to take notes for yourself and share some knowledge. And you can share your work. So when you do write that blog post, when you do publish that GitHub repo, share it, point people to it. Again, you can use hashtags um, as a way if you don't have a lot of Twitter followers for more people to see it. But this is, you know, I think writing the portfolio, the main point is not that you get like hundreds of retweets or you get thousands of view on your posts. It's more for the learning yourself and to have that available when you're talking in interviews about projects you've done. But it is a nice bonus um, if it can help other people and other people can benefit from it. You can share other people's work. So I enjoy tweeting about packages I find useful, papers. Again, sort of this dual benefit of thanking the person who wrote it, showing that I appreciate it, making a note for myself, and hopefully helping other people discover it. Now, that's like you know, sort of broader, like networking Twitter. But what if you want to reach out to a specific person that you're interested in, maybe because uh, some work that they do, a blog post, the company they work on, so on and so forth? I like this post from Trey Causey, which is called, Do You Have Time for a Quick Chat? And what he does is he walks through, uh, first shares what is a typical message he receives, which I have here, which is like, hey, do you have any time for a chat? I'd love to pick your brain. And he shows how he would revise that. So the first thing is to mention the work. So tell them, why are you reaching out? Oh, it's because I read this blog post on data science interviews. So this shows like there's a reason you pick this specific person, which hopefully there is, rather than saying mass messaging or mass connecting with everyone on LinkedIn. Tell them why you know, you're, per you're interested in talking to them specifically. This also shows that you're gonna have questions that weren't answered and things that were publicly written before. So for example, if folks ask about you know, my job search advice, often I'll say, hey, I wrote some, obviously I wrote this book, which you don't have to pay money for, but I also wrote these free blog posts. I have these recorded talks. You know, why don't you start there and let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Second, this person offers a topic. So they say, hey, I'm currently interviewing and the part about whiteboard coding is interesting. I'd love to hear your thoughts about whiteboard coding questions and answers in my own experience. So this lets them know you have a specific thing you want to talk about rather than just like, I just want to talk about everything, like, you know, my whole job search. And finally, suggest a specific limited time. Uh, so in this case, could you spare 30 minutes on, uh, say, Tuesday or Wednesday? Because this gives one, the person you're reaching out to, a better idea of what kind of commitment this will be. And it shows them that you're not necessarily expecting on their first meeting with you to take two hours of their time. If you're looking for people uh, to reach out to, definitely check out datahelpers.org by Angela Bassa. So she put out a call for folks who are interested in helping uh, aspiring or junior data science people, or even some seniors with specific problems, and people volunteered. So I just took a screenshot of some of the volunteers and you can see some of them list specifically what they, they can help with. So for example, that you know, public sector government data or machine learning or time series and R. So this is a really nice place because these people have already said that they're interested in helping out and mentoring a bit about their background, what they can do. Uh, so I definitely recommend starting with this list and you can reach out and say, hey, I saw you on Data Helpers. Maybe see if they have blog posts, other public work. If they don't, you can just say, hey, I saw you on Data Helpers. Um, I would love to chat about your work at a public library. I, you know, have so-and-so background and this is very interesting to me. And then another tip from Gordon Shotwell is do try to be specific. So for example, he says here, how do I learn the basic of neural networks versus how do I learn statistics? Because you know, that statistics question, is, it's, it's so broad and there's so many ways to learn statistics and there's so many specific types of statistics. And it's like, okay, but what? So the first question is kind of like, what do you want to use it for? And this is definitely like hard when you're starting out in a field because you're like, I don't know. Like, I, I, that's what I need you to tell me is what statistics to learn. But if you can, like, you know, you can even ask that. You could say, hey, I'm very new to this field. I don't really know what area to start with. Do you have a book recommendation uh, or something? And that can get you started and you'd be like, okay, I read this book and then I wanna learn, you know, I got really interested in this area. Let me learn some more and ask some more people about that. Finding the right job. Uh, I do feel like sometimes it's like, I just want, you know, a, a, a data science job, like any data scientist job. But I do think it's worth it to take some time and think about like, okay, but what kind of job do you want? And that job actually may not have the data scientist title. So this is Jesse Mosspack, who we interview in chapter five. 
Uh, each chapter of our book, uh, we have 16 chapters, has an interview with a practicing data scientist or data science manager at the end. And she says, think about how attached you are to the data scientist title. Like if you decide to not concern yourself with what you're called and focus on the work that you're doing instead, you have a lot more flexibility to find jobs. That's really true, especially as someone starting out in the field. It is uh, easier to get a related job, um, let's say the data analyst title or program analyst or research and evaluation specialist. Like I said at the start, there's so many jobs that are data science related that also at another company might have the data scientist job title for that exact same job. So if, if you're able to and willing to, I definitely recommend being, being flexible. And I talk about this in this chapter, but you know, for example, just searching terms, terms like data and analysis rather than I must have the data scientist title. But in data science, there are a couple of areas of specialties. And so one, is, and I wanna divide these into these three categories that Airbnb uses, because I really like it. The first is analytics. So this is, uh, says here like defining monitoring metrics, creating data narratives, building tools. Uh, so this, you know, might be called a data analyst at some companies, but it's basically, you know, taking data that's there or gathering it and presenting it to people, whether in a report or in a dashboard. Often you work very closely with product teams or other teams to help them with their analysis needs. Then we have algorithms, you know, you could also call machine learning. So this is about, you know, building and interpreting algorithms that power data products. So this is, I think, maybe what a lot of people think of when they think of data scientists is like the person working on the Amazon, you know, recommendation algorithm that pops up when you're looking at a product page. And finally, we have inference, which we've also called in our book decision science, which is the really statistics part of like establishing causal relationships. So for example, this would be someone working on the Microsoft experimentation team, you know, trying to figure out, all right, we run this uh, A-B test, we, you know, show half the people the old experience, half the new, we have these numbers about how it performed, but can we infer from that, you know, how do we, how do we make sure it's not just noise and confidently infer that, uh, you know, one is better than the other. When you're looking at job descriptions, don't worry about meeting all of the requirements. A lot of time they're wish lists and you really only need to meet 60 or 70% of the core requirements. So that does mean, for example, if they say, you know, we need someone with three years of experience coding in Python. If you've never coded in Python or any like any language at all, yeah, you're probably not qualified for that job. But if you have two years of experience coding in it or two years of professional and three years in school, even if they say three years professional, you probably will be, they'll be very happy with you. So don't let the kind of job post looking for the data science unicorn intimidate you. Finally, consider the types of companies. So in our chapter two, we lay out uh, five different example companies. And of course, not all companies meet this. Um, but you know, a fair amount of them fall into it. So for example, you could have massive tech, you could have your, your Google, your Facebook, you could have a startup, you could have like a mid tech, like Lyft, Airbnb, a government contractor, so on and so forth. And what I put here in this kind of matrix is how those differ along these axes of how much freedom do you have? What's the salary like? What's the job security? And there's not a, you know, a best answer for some people. You may say, you know what? I really value job security. And so I am fine if like, you know, there's a little bit more bureaucracy in my job. The salary's not quite as great because at the end of the day, like I want to have job security and I want to work more of a nine to five job. So, you know, I think like a government contractor would be a great one. Or maybe on the other hand, you're like, I really love freedom. I love moving fast. I want lots of chances to learn. And I don't care if there will be a senior data scientist to help me. So maybe you go to a startup. So there's no right answer to this, but you really want to reflect on what are your needs and what are you looking for in a company? So finally, I want to talk about tailoring your application. So writing a good resume, this is an example resume we share in our book. And there are a couple of things I want to highlight. And you definitely don't have to use this exact format. But some of the things I like about it are it includes your GitHub and your blog. So if you put this work into making a project portfolio, you should share it. It uses clear and consistent formatting. So uh, the color scheme is gray for most of the things, but uh, the title of the position or the major is highlighted in green. The font stays the same. And it's not necessarily, again, like the color isn't the same throughout this resume, but the same type of information always has the same type of color. Next, embrace white space. 
You don't need to have a super cluttered resume that packs everything in. You can let it breathe a little bit because it makes it a lot easier to skim. And limit it to one page. Now there are exceptions to this. So certain industries <coughs> might look for a longer resume. If you have 20 years of experience, you're switching to data scientists, maybe you need two pages. But you know, most people I would say, you know, of under 10 years, you really can fit it into one page. How you can do that, for example, is you know, focus more on the things that are relevant. If you had a job for five years that's really not that relevant to data science, you can just have one bullet point where you describe it and devote more time to the things you have more of. Or you can do a column format and put some things on the side. You can get creative, but in general, again, because people are not gonna spend that much time looking at your resume, you wanna make sure they can quickly hone in on what's important. So for those bullet points, try to quantify your impact. So rather than saying you ran A-B tests on email campaigns, say you conducted 20 A-B tests on email campaigns, resulting in a 35% increase in click rate and a 5% increase in attrib attributed sales. So this quantifies both, okay, like how much of something did you do? And then also, what was the impact? Okay, if it, I just wrote, I conducted 20 A-B tests, on email campaigns, well, A-B tests aren't valuable in and of themselves. They're valuable because of, you know, the, the results that they can have showing you that, hey, this thing, this, uh, you know, treatment is better. You should launch and your sales will increase. So try to try to figure out, okay, rather than saying just like, I wrote this report, you know, like listing what's on your job description, what did it matter? Did it increase sales for the company? Did it like, you know, decrease the amount of time it took someone to do their job because you automated something. Like really think about like, why would other people care that I did this? And related to data science. So, you know, even if you don't have like a, a data science, data analytics background, there's plenty of types of jobs that are really relevant. So for example, were you a teacher, teacher or consultant? Well, there you have communication skills, right? Like you had classroom, you know, for teaching and classroom management, you had to figure out how to explain math to maybe you had an AP class uh, for, you know, BC calculus, but you also had, you know, math students who were, you know, more remedial. And so you had to figure out how to tailor your lessons. Uh, could, did you work in the domain? So for example, if you're a sales executive, maybe you could be a data scientist for the sales team. And that would be hugely valuable to like have been in that system, know how to use Salesforce, like know what sales executives are thinking, so on and so forth. Math and statistics you know, what classes have you done that are related? Uh, did you do any undergraduate research? So for example, let's say you majored in psychology. What if, did you take a psychology statistics class? Did you do psychology research where you had to do statistical tests or data cleaning or data collection? Really try to think, all right, how have I used math and stats, even if the class wasn't necessarily, or the research wasn't called that. And finally, programming and databases. So if you haven't worked in data science, have you used Excel, SurveyMonkey, Google Analytics, Tableau, SQL, any of these tools? They're not all tools. Some of them are tools you might still use as a data scientist, especially SQL. But even if you never use Excel again, you can talk about like the projects that you did with it. And it shows that you've worked with data, even if you use a different tool. And of course, the personal projects that we talked about with the portfolios. And this is, a cover letter is not always required, but it sometimes is. And what you want here is first to try to find the hiring manager name if you can. So sometimes that's listed in the position. Uh, sometimes you can look on LinkedIn. If it's a smaller company, especially like it's okay if you go two levels up. So say you're applying to a company and you find the director of data. Okay, maybe they're not who's gonna be your manager, but it still shows you did research on the company, you know, to try to figure out who would be a relevant person. And it shows that you're tailoring to this company. Next, tie together your experience. So your cover letter should be a story. It's not just a repeat of your resume, but instead saying like, okay, how does all this experience fit together? So give some examples of, uh, you know, the work that you've done, talk about a little bit more. So, you know, here you can read like prior to this, I was at bootcamp, I was an investment consultant, like I took people to Python, I tailored a curriculum, so on and so forth and focus on what you can offer to the company. So the company's not interested in like, oh, this place would be a great place to start my career. Like, or, you know, it's nice to say that you love it and you research it, but they really care about like, well, what are you gonna do for us? Why should we hire you? And what you wanna show is, look, I can solve a problem that you're facing with this experience. That last point, tailor it to the company. So if, uh, you know, if for example, it's in, let's say you have multiple, projects and one of them's, I don't know, and like in a, related to web data, you know, 
website com web companies that you're applying to, maybe use that project because that's going to be more relevant to them. So I want to close out by doing a brief recap of some of the takeaway points. So first, you don't need to know everything. Don't let yourself get paralyzed by these must-know lists or all these things you can learn in data science or all the millions of courses because no one knows everything. You don't need to know everything to do you know, a great thing at your job, and you'll always be learning. So don't let that hold you back. There's no such thing as a fake data scientist. I, I just really don't like this point, um, you know, of, of there being a fake data scientist, no. You know, if, if you, data science is a broad enough umbrella for us all. But that being said, you may want to let go of the data scientist title because there's so many positions where you can be doing interesting data science work that may not have that title for whatever reason and will also honestly have less competition for those jobs. So maybe that's something you want to have eventually, but for your first job, Try to focus more instead on like, okay, what can I learn? How can I gain experience? And not so much what I will be called. So when you're applying a job, remember to focus on creating a portfolio to, to one, help yourself learn, and two, show off your skills, to expand your network, to find the right job, not just any job, and to tailor your application. And so with that, I wanna thank everyone for coming and I'm gonna take questions in a minute. If uh, you enjoyed this talk, you can find uh, some data science career related posts and some other data science uh, topics on my blog, hookedondata.org. You can also find me on Twitter at Robinson underscore ES. And like I said, this is all covered in the book with a bunch more stuff. Uh, that's available at datasciCareer.com and you can get 40% off with MTP Umbrella 20. Thank you. Yes, and I am open to answering questions as soon as I can remember how to not share. There we go. How to stop sharing. Great. So do you want me to read the question? Yeah, that would be helpful. Okay. So the first one that had five upvotes is how um, different is a data analyst role from a data scientist role? Ah, oh, great question. So. This is hard because uh, a couple reasons. One is there's definitely a disagreement about this. So some people divide it as it's about the tools that you use. So like a data analyst will use a graphical user interface, something like Tableau or Excel, whereas a data scientist uses scripted language like R or Python. Uh, other people say it's about the type of problems that you tackle. So I just listened to the Super Data Science podcast with uh, Kirill, and he said he divides it as a data analyst is term of the exact term is basically doing like descriptive analytics about the past, what's happened before. And a data scientist is doing predictive, what's going to happen. And some uh, also uh, some analysis of what, what we prescriptive, what should we do based on that? So that's another way. Uh, so there's all these different ways to divide it. And the other problem is what it means at companies varies so much. So there's a good blog post from Lyft about how they changed all of their data analysts to be data scientists and their data scientists to be research scientists two years ago. Uh, Etsy, where I used to work, did a similar thing. Um, whereas previously the data analyst team, we were working, we were using R and Python and stats and you know doing some, uh, you know, even some machine learning, but we were embedded with, uh, um, you know, sort of uh, other teams. And basically we said we did data for data science for human consumption. The data scientist team was about working on the ad algorithms or the search ranking algorithms. So they did data science for machine consumption. But then since I left, they changed their title to data scientist. So really it's so different from, from company to company. Um, but in terms of looking at positions with a data analyst, what I would look out for is finding a position where you can use R or Python, and there's some also, you know, some like stats or math or something that you can do in there um, as well. But really, just any. If, but on the other hand, you know, if you've never worked with data before, maybe you just want to start out with like, you know, I just want to start working with data. It's okay if it's in Excel. It's okay if it's Google Analytics. Like it'll just get me comfortable. Okay. The next question is, what red flags should you look out for when interviewing for a data scientist? Role? I'm just laughing because I don't. 
I don't think this was planted, but Jacqueline and I, before we wrote the book, actually, actually published a blog post called 12 Red Flags in Data Science Interviews that you should look out for as a candidate. Uh, so that's on my blog. Definitely feel free to check that out. Uh, I'll just highlight a few. I think one of the biggest ones is data engineering. So is there data available? Is there any data? Is there a data engineering team? Um, you know, have they done the work to make the data available? Or are you going to spend your first year basically being a data engineer and building a data warehouse? Now, that could be fine if that's what you want to do, but you should know that going in. Uh, and the second thing I'll say is if you're starting out as a data scientist, I think most folks should try to go to a to a team uh, where there's already an established uh, data company, where there's an established data science team, rather than being the first or the second data scientist, because that way you'll get more mentorship, you'll learn more best practices. But there's a bunch more, like I said, so feel free to uh, check out the blog post. Okay. The next one is from Cecily, and it is, is it absolutely necessary to have a CS slash mathematics background to start a career in data science? Yeah, it's definitely not absolutely necessary. Um, I mean, at some, like at some point, you will need to pick up some of those skills, right? Like at some point, you know, you, whether that's Coursera or doing a boot camp. Uh, but you definitely, I know people who were, in terms of like their formal education in college, uh, I know someone who's like an English major. You know, lots of people with a social science uh, major, so maybe did a few stats classes, but definitely not a math or a computer science degree. So you really don't need to, and don't forget uh, and don't think of that as a negative. So as I was talking about when you're thinking about on your resume, how to you know tailor how you talk about your previous positions to data science, like that's not just something like to like trick the hiring manager uh, into hiring you. Like you truly think about like, you know, liberal arts education, learning to communicate, learning to write well, maybe learning to do presentations. That's hugely important. A social sciences background is all about doing research. Like that's my background, very similar to the data science uh, process. So you definitely don't need to have uh, that background. But I will say that is one of the places where a project portfolio is more helpful. Uh, like if you're someone who's like, you know, I have a data science degree, I have a math degree, a computer science you know, maybe you don't need a project portfolio. You did enough relevant projects in undergraduate. People tell from your resume, like you have very relevant work experience. But if you don't have, if your resume doesn't right now show the data science skills that you have, a portfolio can be really helpful for that. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Sammy. And um, question is, hello, Emily. I just graduated from Metis. Um, questions are, I seriously suffer from serious imposter syndrome. Do you have some tips on how to get rid of imposter syndrome? Oh God, uh, I wish I, so one, definitely check out uh, Caitlin Houdin's post on, and let me actually just pull it up really quickly so I can post it in the chat on imposter syndrome. Cause it's a great, it's a really great post. Um, and so it highlights a couple thing, which is first, like part of the reason imposter syndrome is, so easy to fall into in data science is because it's a new field. So as Poch she makes in the post, it's a new field, it's a combo of other fields. It's constantly expanding. Uh, so you have all these things, right? Where it's like, well, you have a data scientist, so I need to go computer science and also stats and I need to communicate. And like, I also need to do this other thing. And you know, you're probably never gonna be as much of an expert as someone who just focused in that. So that's hard. There's always new technologies. So even if someone magically you learned everything about data science right now, uh, you're, you know, Two years from now, there'll be a new technology. And so you won't know everything anymore. So that's one of the reasons I think it's so common. And what uh, Kaylin says she does to deal with this is just like try to remember like, you know, what she, what she does know. So accepting that you can't know everything, but that's okay. But I do know things other people don't. Like I've built these predictive models. I've, you know, uh, you know, learned to do machine learning models in production. Like remember what you do know and how valuable that is. So. That's been some helpful for me, but I think the other thing, honestly, is having a community that will help support you. Um, so I've, you know, I've had people, I mentioned a little bit about working at Metis. There are some random people on the internet, mostly on Reddit, where you don't have your real name, who are like a, a bootcamp graduate can never be a real data scientist, essentially. Like a bootcamp education just can't be. And, you know, I, I, I want, 
hopefully some point I'll get to the point where like, I can just be like, nope, you know, I'm secure in myself. I, you know, will not, this doesn't bother me at all, but it did bother me. But one thing that helped was like talking to other data scientists that I know. Um, and that really helped me is like, yes, there's some internal work you need to do, but also that it's something nice for like turning to friends, turning to former colleagues who are like, what are you kidding? You, you, you did great work on that project. Like you did all these things, like you're so valuable. So that at least has helped me because the community also reminds you when you talk to these people, when you get to know like that data scientist at Airbnb or like these other things you admire, you get to know, oh wait, they don't, they don't know everything either. You know, they also have doubts. They are people too. And I think that can really help uh, break down this image of some of these folks on Twitter that they always feel confident that they know everything that no one ever criticizes them. Because when you get to know them, you're like, hey, no, these are actually people that I can relate to on a personal level. Great, thanks. So one person asked three questions, but I do want to give other people a chance. So I'll come back to that person once we get through them. Um, um, Sushmita asked, do companies value data science certifications from MOOCs like Coursera, edX, and Udemy? I, it depends on the company. Uh, like I saw um, Google was saying they come out with like a career certification that they said they would count the same as a four-year college degree. And I think one of them is like data analytics. So I guess in that case, yes. Um, I would say more so, I think it you can keep it on there. It can be like, oh, like a nice little plus, like cool, they're continuing to educate yourself. It's probably not enough to get you the job uh, and, or even to get you necessarily the interview, right? Because I think some folks still have doubts, you know, compared to like a four-year college degree, they're like, oh, well, like, you know, could they have cheated? Because they've just watched these lectures passively. So I think much more effective is taking that knowledge that you learn in the course and applying it in a project. So I don't think it will hurt, but I don't necessarily think it's going to be a big factor in deciding whether to interview or hire you. Okay, sorry about that. I had to close the window. The sirens were very loud um, in New York. Um, Alange, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing the name um, correctly, asks, uh, do you have any specific advice for people who are switching careers? Yeah, I mean, I think, so pretty much everything I said in the talk like applies, right? Some of it a little more so, like I mentioned earlier, like project portfolios might be especially helpful. Um, but I really do think, two things one you know with this like let go of the data scientist title like it depends like how far away was your previous career right is your previous career a software engineer which is like pretty adjacent to data science or was it a i don't know art historian at the met which like you is pretty unrelated in terms of domain uh although you know again you have think but in that case think about communication skills like what can you bring and how can you maybe start doing data as part of your job now so I don't, I don't really know much about art historians, but like, can you analyze some data? Can you, you know, post, make a blog post about like, you know, some of the works or like some history of art and like show a visualization of how that changed over time. So if you're thinking about switching careers, try to find ways, can you incorporate data analysis, data science into your current job? Um, and if at all possible, because that can be a really good way when you're you know, talking in job interviews or writing on your resume that you can be like, yes, I know this sounds like an unrelated career, but actually look, I found this way to do data. I got these communication skills. Um, just really think about how you can frame what you're doing as something relevant to the field. All right, the next question is from Juan who asks, for someone trying to switch careers into data science, is a master's in data science a good idea or are there better ways to get into the industry? So we have, we write it, all right, so chapter three is on exactly this, which is like, how do I get the skills to be a data scientist? Um, I think master's is one way. The downside is the cost in terms of like the actual monetary cost and also the opportunity costs, right? So if you're doing a full-time master's, you probably can't work. So you're not earning a salary for that time. The other thing with data science master's specifically is you really want to be, uh, thoughtful and um, in picking the school because there are some good programs out there, but they're all relatively new, right? Like none of them really existed before five years ago. Uh, and some of them are just trying to cash in on this phase uh, and will be taught, you know, maybe they'll be teaching like outdated technologies and other professors have worked in industry or they just cobbled together like these statistics and these computer science courses without actually like making it a, uh, you know, curriculum that goes together. So how you can sort of tell that is definitely look at the syllabus 
Um, if you know some folks in data science, like you reach out to them, uh, talk what they think about it. Also really ask and look at the alums. Like what are people who graduated from this program doing? How will this help you find a job? So it's one way. The other uh, couple ways we cover are you could uh, do a boot camp um, and you can learn on the job. So like I talked about the artist store and how can I use data on my job? Or third, you can self-teach, right? You can do uh, online courses and things like that. Uh, so if you want to learn more, definitely check out chapter three, but that's sort of my short bit on data science masters. Okay. Um, this next question that, that I really like is, what is the best part and worst part of your current job? Uh, so, yeah, so I, I, I think, um, I'll actually say like kind of, it's, it's a twofold thing of kind of like in, in some ways, like the same thing being in some ways the best and the worst, which is, uh, I now work on a centralized team of data scientists. So previously at Etsy, I reported to another, well, at that time, another data analyst, but I was embedded with the search team. So I was in their Slack channel. I was in their meetings. Uh, you know, they were the people who were kind of like day to day, like telling me like, you know, what are some things that I should work on? And then at uh, my last company, I reported to the vice president of growth. So I was fully embedded in the growth team, which was running experiments. And now at Warby Parker, the data science team is centralized. So we're like a small data science core team. And we work with different departments, uh, usually for a couple months at a time. So that's been something that's been really exciting because, you know, we get to have an impact on lots of different departments. But it's also, you know, sometimes I miss like being working really closely with another team, like getting to know them, at, you know, individually really well, really getting to know that problem space versus, you know, more of like a, a couple months like deployment working on one specific project. Uh, so I don't think, you know, that's something also to think about when looking at data science jobs. You can definitely ask about them. They may use different terminologies, but the two things to look for essentially are, will you report to another data scientist or to, you know, like the head of the e-commerce team? And uh, are you going to be mainly working with one team or does your team, you know, work with lots of teams and you'll switch maybe every couple months? Okay. Uh, the next question is for, um, our, uh, is from Artemis. Um, Related questions, Cecily, what are good resources for brushing up on statistics, probability, and other math topics necessary for data science? Yeah, so I'm going to post uh, one link here. So Naked Statistics is a really good um, introductory, like, especially if you have very little background in statistics, it's like a great, like very friendly, like not, there's not a lot of equations. It's more about how do I think about statistics? Like what do these terms mean? Um, so that's a good place to get started. And then the other one I recommend is Introduction to Statistical Learning. So this is like a very classic book uh, in the field. It's also available for free online. Uh, there is code in uh, R that's included along with it. But even if you're learning Python, you can, I don't know if you want, you could try to translate the code, but you could also, uh, you know, just focus. Most of the book is not about the code, it's about the concepts. Uh, and I really think if you, you know, just go through that book and learn that pretty well. That is, you know, pretty much all the statistics and machine learning you need to get started. Okay. The next job is, the next, the next question is from Jia Wu. The current job market is still competitive. Every DS job, data science job has thousands of applications. Is building connection and getting to this recruiter, getting to the recruiter the only way to get through this? So it depends on the company. Right. So I would not say necessarily every data science job has thousands of applications because like a small startup that most people haven't heard of is probably not getting a thousand applications. But yes, like, well, pre COVID times, I would say Airbnb, although, of course, they've they've had to lay off people and have a hiring freeze. But like, you know, Google, uh, you know, all the kind of like big names like, yes, those do actually have thousands of applications. And it's true, like the really the main way that people get that is through a referral. So through someone that already works there that you know, you've maybe worked with them before or potentially you get by reaching out or knowing the recruiter. So that's why I would say like maybe don't start with those companies, but look at like, okay, what are some smaller companies? What are some local companies? You know, if you don't live in New York City or San Francisco, you know, you might also have an advantage there. Like, I don't know, you're in uh, Nashville is not that small a city, but like, you know, a city like Nashville, where yes, on the one hand, there are fewer data science jobs, but on the other hand, you know, there's less competition, there's less people vying for them. Uh, so I do think, yes, most of the time, 
uh, for these really prominent companies. Uh, some of them do, like the ones in the middle, like I think Etsy when I was there did look at every resume that came through, at least skimmed it. Uh, but some companies do have automated systems that you know narrow down these thousand resumes based on keywords to the hundred that a uh, recruiter will look for. And sometimes they do employ some rules of thumb, like, okay, if it's a new grad position, this is your GPA, or you have to be from this schools, or you have to have this major. Um, and so in that case, yes, I do think like having those connections is always going to be really, really helpful, but it's possible. And people do get jobs, especially at smaller companies uh, by applying on their website. The next question is from Wasilla. If you're already good in either Python or R, would it be a plus to learn the other language as well? I think it's a plus if you're finding jobs that you're interested in that use the other language, yes, um, right? Because you, you can definitely start that job. You know, you, I, I know people have gotten jobs who've been very experienced in one language and they've gotten jobs that will use the other because they basically said like, look, I know I'll do all these things in R. Um, you know, I've started learning Python and I'm confident that I can get up to speed and like do this like great work that you wanna hire me for and do it in Python. Um, but if you're just like, I don't know, I just like, you know, yeah, I'm happy with the language I have. I just randomly kind of wanna know the other one. I think probably not. I would focus more on um, getting good at the your main language. And if needed, there's a lot of tools coming out to make R and Python work really well together. So for example, um, there's Reticulate for R. So if there is something like, okay, I wanna use R for most things, but there's this Python package that I really wanna use for this specific model, you can just use it for that part, right? So you do all of your, your data gathering and your data cleaning. Uh, you know, and, and, and data munging, and then do this Python package for the machine learning model, and then you use uh, R again for visualizations and report writing. So that's also an option. So maybe it, if there's something you're like, I know R, I know the other language has this tool that I really want that doesn't exist in mine and I wanna learn it, that could be a good reason to learn the other one. But I wouldn't just say like, oh, I just, you know, it's better to learn both. I would, I would more stick to one unless you have a good reason to learn the other one. The next question is um, from Luke. Is there any specific advice you would give someone coming out of college for breaking into the field? Tips for getting interviews with very little professional experience. Yes, so the first thing is definitely look for positions that have new grad. Uh, so some of the bigger companies will have this where it'd be like specifically for recent college graduates. Second is data scientists is becoming more of a title uh, for people with at least a few years of work experience, even if not necessarily as a data scientist, say as like a data analyst or a software engineer. So again, that's sort of like maybe letting go of the title. Like some companies just don't hire junior data scientists. They don't hire entry level. They hire data analysts for that role uh, or, other, or other things like that. Um, and then finally, uh, if you can, if, if your school that you graduated from has a career resources center, like definitely go to that, um, you know, ask them for help with your resume. A lot of them will do this for free if you're a recent grad uh, and reach out on LinkedIn to people who have graduated from say your same major um, or, you know, who just went into a career that you're interested in say, hey, I'm a recent graduate from, you know, X university, which this person also went to. You know, I saw that you're, you know, a, a data scientist at this company. I'm really interested in the field. I majored in this, uh, you know, would you have time to 30 minutes to chat? Uh, you don't know, recognize, especially in these times, like for example, parents of young kids just may not have a lot of extra time, but there are lots of people who like helping people. And also maybe, and especially like new graduates, especially someone they have a connection to, even if that connection is just that you graduated from the same school. Okay. The next question is from Shah. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I was interested in what your suggestion would be in regard to an individual who has no prior tech experience, but wants to progress into the data world. What program would you suggest starting with? Yes, so I would, so I would suggest, um, so there's lots of different options here, but I would maybe start out with reading. I'm also gonna post this in the chat. Uh, People feel free to chime in if you have Python resource. Like I said, I'm more of an R person, but like you could start with the R for data science book, which is available for free online. Uh, you know, start looking for that. I really like it because um, for example, Python, like there are some for this, but there are a lot of 
I wouldn't necessarily start with just like learn Python because they're going to talk about things that aren't that relevant to data science um, versus the R for data science is like start by visualizing data, which is like, yes, I want to visualize data. Um, so if you have no prior experience, I'd start with like, okay, first let, let's try something out and let's try, you know, read R for data science. There's some built-in uh, data sets in R. And so just try like, okay, here's this built-in data set in cars. How would I find which car has the most miles per gallon? Okay. How would I narrow it down to just the cars that have, you know, this much, uh, you know, this many cylinders, so on and so forth. And because you want to start, I would say, like, before you necessarily say, oh, I do a master's or a boot camp, I put a lot of money and time, like, start trying it out, start seeing as even if your job's not tech related, is there any data around, right? Is there like anything you can do that's related? Or if not, can you like start moving that way? And if, you know, again, if not, like, try practicing it in your free time. Uh, and look for a community of other people. So like R for Data Science, for example, has an online community of learning and has a Slack channel. That can be another nice place to just find other people um, who are going through the same thing as you. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Eliana, which is what's a good way to practice SQL skills that employers value? Yeah, so it's funny, I, I call it SQL. That's the other like debate. Is it SQL or is it SQL? Is it uh, data or data? Um, so SQL skills, so more, so SQL, I would say you don't so much need like a project that shows you use SQL, um, like versus like it's helpful to have a project that shows like R or Python. Instead, um, you know, list on your resume, you a lot of companies have SQL technical screens. So that's going to be how they test like whether you know SQL. And so, you know, it's more about like, that's where you're gonna like prove it. So it's more about, okay, how do I get those skills to pass that technical interview? So there's a bunch of SQL tutorials online. Honestly, like I would focus on, there's not a ton of advanced one, but I wouldn't really worry about it that much. Like uh, I'm gonna post like W3 SQL schools. That's a great one to start again, all free. Uh, and yeah, this is a great place to start and just learn things like, okay, how do I uh, filter a SQL table? How do I do some like string manipulation? How do I join? That's mostly the stuff that's going to come up. Um, and you can look, uh, you know, if you also Google like SQL interview questions, um, you'll get some like good example questions that you might uh, face. Like we have a few in our book as well. Okay. The next question is from Aditi. Um what is the most effective way to transition your career from data analytics focus to more inference based something that companies are more more comfortable calling a data scientist it's mm, a good question uh so i think i think there's probably like a twofold approach to this which is one like do you feel that you have the skills already so for example like Maybe you have a statistics background, you just haven't used it in your job, or you've taken some online courses, uh, or you've you know read textbooks. So if you don't feel you have those skills yet, I would definitely kind of start there, um, you know, and read up on it and build those skills. Uh, and then, but once you do feel like that, I think that's honestly something I would talk to your manager about. I think first the question is, is there area in your current job where you could use inference skills, right? Is there area you could be more stats focused? Because maybe there is, and that could be a great place to start. Or maybe it turns out they're like, you know what? No, like we really just don't, we don't need it. Um, if that's the case, you can see like, if your own judgment is maybe like, actually they say this, but I really think a model here would be useful. Um, you know, maybe try that, you know, on, on your, either on your own time, or if you have some extra time during your day and present that to them and say like, Hey, I know, like, you know, uh, uh, I thought this, you know, I came up with this idea. I thought it was really valuable. What do you think? Um, or if there's really just nothing at your job, uh, I think it is sort of a process of looking at other jobs and to show you're qualified for that job. The first thing is one, also your analytics experience will be, uh, will be relevant. So even more inference jobs, you're still doing a lot of like analytics work. Uh, you know, my, my co-author Jacqueline has a blog post, you're not paid to model, which is like modeling is the last step of this very long process of like getting the data, talking to people, you know, cleaning it, so on and so forth. Um, so even in those jobs, your skills would be very useful. Uh, and to show that you're prepared for them, again, part of it's going to be an interview or a take home assignment. So, uh, you know, if you're applying to those jobs, you get to that stage. Um, you know, practicing uh, on those take-home assignments, like seeing how you're doing. Okay, are they asking you something and you're like, oh, I thought I could do this, but actually they're asking for this. And like, I, I'm really like not comfortable with 
understanding my outputs or you know making a recommendation from it, then it's maybe time to go back to building those skills. Uh, so I think it's really coming down to kind of pinpointing, all right, what what are these kind of steps to getting that job? Uh, what's the what's the next point, and how do I keep building towards that? Are you okay to answer more questions? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the next question is from Neely, which is, how general do you go in your LinkedIn profile? While the general advice is to tailor your resume to the company, it seems difficult to do that on your public LinkedIn as well. How general is Yes. That? It's definitely, yeah, I don't, uh, in terms of me, I haven't really like tailored to anything. Um, definitely, I think much more important with your LinkedIn profile, along with just, you know, have the basic information about where you worked, all that good stuff is to have those resume bullet points um, and where, for example, you focus on quantifying it, you're showing your impact. Uh, you could also think about like what I do with Metis is I like, it, I think I do this on my LinkedIn. I give like a little explainer of like what Metis is and some of my projects. The nice thing about LinkedIn is you don't really have to worry about space. Like I wouldn't do 20 bullet points for a job, but maybe you can do four instead of the two you had to limit on your resume to wake at one page. So I wouldn't, you could tailor it as much at, you know, your summary, maybe if you're like pretty much all the jobs I'm looking for are going to be in the financial uh, industry, or they're going to be very analytics fo focused jobs. You know, you can put that in your summary, um, but that's something where it's like, you're not so much tailoring to a specific company as telling people what types of companies and positions you're interested in. Okay. Um, so again, with the questions, I'm sort of skipping over some just to give people who haven't asked a question to ask their question first. So Susanna asks, how do you assess what is doable for one person and how do you figure out what percentage of your time is spent on each period of the project life cycle? So doable for one, okay, versus I guess like a, a team. Um, hmm, that's a good question. I think, so I'm guessing this is like asking about like at a, at a company, not like your personal portfolio project. Um, so yeah, if you're at a company, uh, I think one is like our team has been thinking a lot about like doing that scoping when you start the project. And uh, so we have in our book uh, chapter 10s on making uh, making an effective analysis. And one of the things we recommend is making an analysis plan. So making a document that you agree with your stakeholder of these are the questions I'm going to answer. Like here are the overarching ones. Like and here are some specific things I'm going to do to answer that question, because what that can help with is it just limits the scope and you agree with your stakeholders. So they sign off on it. And if you get to the end, like sometimes like, oh, you know, we tried these things, we like, couldn't find the answer to this question or, you know, it turns out this isn't feasible. Uh, it can be really easy for them to be like, just, you know, just keep digging, just pull in this other data set, just pull in that thing. And you can be like, okay, you know, but we need to re-talk about this and maybe this would be phase two of this project and re-scoping it because, you know, we agreed to this part of the work. And also, you know, and we have different, we have, we're juggling multiple priorities here. So, that's one thing I find helpful in terms of like one person versus multiple. Um, I think that really depends on your team structure. Uh, so at uh, data camp, like I was the only, that was my last company. I was the only data scientist on the growth team, but I could get help from the chief data scientists or other people. But at Etsy, there are other, there are two other analysts working on the search team. So I think that's like much more of an, individual like working with your your manager type thing and a little bit of trial and error because sometimes you start projects and you're like this is a lot more work than I thought it was when we scoped out it would take a month let me revisit this with my manager and if needed the stakeholders okay um the next question is from Carlos um regarding the process of analyzing data at work what's the most important competence you, do you think someone um, making a career change should develop for a, for example this meaning data visualization versus tidy mm -hmm. data? Mm. So I think this, uh, it does depend somewhat on your job, um, like what type of data science position. I do think you need to be able to like make a full, like simple, but a full simple analysis yourself. So you need to be able to take some messy data to tidy it. Like maybe that's a little string manipulation. Maybe that's making a new column. You need to visualize it. You need to like make that into little reports. So like a very, but like, I mean, like a very simple, not like, oh, this is a really complex data set, but you do need to be able to do that full cycle. In terms of like, okay, great, I kind of have this baseline, like which should I develop more? 
I think honestly, it's like some of your interests. Like I know some people are data visualizations expert. Like maybe you want to go work as at a newspaper and be a data visualization person and that you might need to learn D3 uh, to make interactive web visualizations. So maybe that's what you go down or you're like, I'm going to go work at this company that uh, I really want to work at a small company. And I know they may not have a lot of data engineers. So I need to work more on like making the like the ETL, like extract, transform, load process. I really want to work on like, okay, how do I take data and like make it into a usable format? Uh, so I don't think that necessarily like one is the right answer, but you do want to make sure that you have that that baseline of being able again, like doesn't have to be like, you know, the most complicated thing I can deal with, you know, 50 million, you know, row data sets by making an AWS, like, you know, spinning up an AWS cluster, but you should be able to do like a full analysis uh, from getting and cleaning the data to presenting the results. That's, um, that's, that's good advice. Uh, Daria asks, which R SQL package have you tried or would you recommend, or is it better to stay with SQL itself? So, the interview mm -hmm. process. Yes. Uh, so I love dbplyr. Um, so dbplyr, you can write dplyr code. It gets translated into SQL. You just have to do like a little setup thing at the at the top to uh, like connect it to the SQL database. For interviews, though, I would spend some time like learning SQL. Uh, now, fortunately, with an R, if you're using dplyr, like the concepts are very similar. You just have to be like, oh, it's not a filter. It's a where. Um, you know, but left join is the same, like all that stuff. Uh, but I would spend some time learning SQL, like again, sort of these basics, joining where, and also one of my favorite things uh, called common table expressions. So for the interview itself, yes, depending on your job, you may end up doing like I did a, at data camp, like all of your, your SQL uh, using dbplyr in R and writing our code, or most of the SQL. All right, the next question is from Tiwa, which is, do you think a master's is beneficial to advance your data science career to management? I, like, I guess, I'm guessing it's like a master in like stats or computer science or data science. Honestly, probably not. Like a lot of ways that people go into management is often there's an opening, they're working as a data scientist at a company and there's an opening on their team. So maybe a manager left, maybe the team is growing, it needs a manager and you kind of raise your hand for it that you're interested in, in it. And the types of skill you need in management, like, yeah, it, some companies managers still like stay fairly technical and do their own data science projects, but other companies, like, honestly, like it's not so much your data science skills. There might be a technical lead, like when people need mentorship on like R or Python and your job is a lot more like, okay, let me uh, mentor, mentor the team in their you know, communication skills and scoping out projects. I will help give them cover. I will work with the other, like, you know, the broader company to figure out what we should be working on. And like those types of skills are not things you're going to learn in a data science master's program. So, you know, that's it. There's always exceptions. Maybe there are some there, there. I could definitely believe there are some companies where they're like, nope, we require a formal master's degree in the field to be in management. But most companies, I would say that's not necessary. The next question is from Merdad, which is, when we reach an interview meeting with a data scientist team, what type of questions are more important for them? For example, for a company working in mining and maintenance field, I heard they may give us a hacker rank challenge. Yeah, so that's, uh, the hard part is kind of what you're hitting on there is that the data science interviews, there's just so many questions that they could ask. Oh my God, you could be asked to like, you know, some super like mathematical, like derive a ketosis of something, or you could be asked this like hacker rank or leak code question and so on and so forth. And, you know, you hit on something like you might be able to predict that a little bit based on the industry, based on the type of job. Like if you're looking for a machine learning position, you're more likely to get these like algorithm questions, like leak code questions. If you're looking for a decision science, very stats heavy inference position, you know, more likely to be on the stats side. But really, I think the best way is if you're getting, you know, if you if you've, you know, sent your resume in, you got a call with the hiring manager, they're like, we want to, you know, let's say maybe it's after the take home, we want to bring you on site is ask, like, you could absolutely ask the recruiter, or the hiring manager, hey, like, you know, what, what should I be preparing for, for these interviews, and they're not going to tell you the question. But a good hiring manager interview with recruiter will say like, oh, okay, you know, your first 30 minutes, you'll be, you know, working with uh, Emily on SQL code and you'll, you know, writing SQL. And the next one will be a case study, you know, with our product manager. And the next one will be, you know, uh, you know, uh, our exercise with uh, this uh, engineer, so on and so forth. So you can uh, definitely ask, 
look on Glassdoor if it's a bigger company, if they've hired data scientists before, uh, they might have uh, the data science questions there. But yeah, unfortunately it is, uh, you know, maybe you can ask on Reddit, you can ask on Twitter, like, hey, I'm interested in this industry. Is anyone in experience with this industry know like what types of question they ask? But yeah, it's, it's such uh, a variety. And that's also why if you don't progress in an interview, like don't, don't think like, oh, this means I'm never going to be cut out for data scientists. Like think about like, you know, give yourself an awesome review and be like, okay, like, yeah, I sort of froze up because yeah, I'm really good at our code, but I kind of forgot I have to write a for loop. So let me practice that. That might come up again. But also, you know, just because you couldn't answer this like random, like invert a binary tree computer science question, it doesn't mean it will come up in another interview. It doesn't mean you're not equipped to be a data scientist. The next question is from Tiffany. How did you decide you wanted to do data science? Yeah, so a little bit about my background. So I'm also going to post this uh, interview I gave right after I started at Etsy. Uh, I'm going to post it in the chat. Uh, but yeah, so I was in a PhD program in organizational behavior. Uh, and the social science is, that's basically psychology and sociology applied to work. And I realized, hey, I don't really want to go into academia. So I decided to leave with my master's degree after two years. But then it's like, well, now what do I do? And data science appealed to me because it had a lot of the similar process to social science research, especially quantitative social science research. So coming up with a question like, investigating past research on it, gathering data, whether through an experiment or an archival data set, uh, you know, analyzing it, presenting it to your advisor who knows a ton about this field, but also to this qualitative researcher who like has, you know, never heard of this technique or this uh, domain you're in and how do you communicate that? So like I, it was similar enough in that way, which is great. Um, but then the other part uh, that you know, brought me to data science was what I liked about it was the immediate impact that it could have. So in academia, you might write a research paper. One, it could take seven years to publish. Two, you publish it and maybe no one ever reads it or benefits from it versus working in industry at a company in data science. I really like this. Like I'm working with teams to solve their problems. Uh, you know, I'm going to be able to help them and use these skills that I've learned. I, you know, I minored in statistics, I like, you know, math and programming and R I learned as part of my undergraduate continued in, in uh, grad school, I can use this to, uh, you know, to help people. So that's really what drew me, drew me to data science. Okay, the next question is from Bharati. Trying to make career changes, what courses do you suggest to make a start? Yeah, so I think this is, uh, you know, really dependent on kind of what you need the most of so for example did you come from you know one of like either computer science or stats or you're like no i didn't come I, I you know again i was a liberal arts major i don't have any of that so where do i start um honestly there are so i recommend like introduction to statistical learning as a book i i'm not as good at answering this because i do have more of that formal background so i've picked i've definitely learned a lot on my own but it's mostly been sort of contained like oh i need to learn time series let me find the time series textbook or, you know, I need to learn how to handle this type of data in R. So let me take this course. So I don't, fortunately, I don't necessarily have like a great recommendation for you. But I think the important thing is to try to find something, uh, you know, think about how you learn best. Like there are some interactive courses, uh, you know, online. Like, do you, would you like to do that where you're coding in the browser? Or are you someone who could, you know, just listen to a video, an hour video lecture and like take notes? So Thinking about like how you can, how you can learn best, uh, you know, will help you figure out like what types of courses. Okay, the next question is from Lauren. Can you say more about your experience at Metis? Yeah, so I did Metis uh, back in uh, summer of 2016. So right after I finished uh, my master's. And yeah, I enjoyed it. It was a good fit for me. So basically I had the statistics, I had the R knowledge, but I wanted uh, to learn some more like machine learning to learn some Python, and also to have some time to learn Git and GitHub and build a project portfolio. So I enjoyed Metis because that's what Metis is built around. So you have about two hours of uh, like course during the day, but then the afternoon is all about working on your own project. And that starts out like pretty structured. So it's like, okay, work with the IMDB data set to make these predictions about movie ratings. But by the end of it, it's just like do something with natural language processing. Like you have to come up with a question, you get the data, um, but you know, there's the instructors there to help, there are other people in the class there to help. Uh, so that worked really well for me. 
I would say, but the advantage I had there was I moved home. So I moved back to New York. Uh, so I lived rent free with my parents uh, and I hadn't like my master's degree, I had a stipend, but it wasn't sort of just enough to live on. So it wasn't like I'd gone from making, you know, uh, $70,000 a year and suddenly I had to figure out how do I live without a salary for the three months of Metis? And it's going to take usually a couple months after graduating to start a job. So I started my job about three months after Metis ended. So a total of six months, um, you know, where I wasn't making an income. So you do have to definitely weigh that against uh, what you can get from Metis. But the last thing I'll say also is helpful is, you know, I wouldn't say most boot camps sort of like MOOCs, they're not going to like get you the job or maybe even the interview by having on your resume. It's much more about the experience you have there. So like what might get your job is not like, oh, she went to Metis. It's like, oh, she did this, this uh, cool project and I see this blog post or she made this dashboard and that's exactly what we need. So why don't we at least talk to her? Um, so that's the advantage. And finally, uh, it's also helpful that Metis now, as, as well as other boot camps, have a fair amount of alumni because they've been around for a few years. So that's also going to be helpful if you're interested in a company. And I did this when I was looking. Uh, there were fewer alumni then, but there are a few companies I was interested in that I talked to a data scientist. One referred me and also the other one said, don't work here, which was really helpful. They were like, this is not a good data science team. And I never would have known that if not for having that connection uh, through Metis and reaching out to them. All right. Um, the next question is from Wasella. This might be too specific to answer, but when you're job hunting for your first data science job, about what application to interview ratio would you expect? Yeah, so, and this is really, yeah, this is hard to answer because yeah, it's kind of very specific per person. So I think a big thing that influences this here is how like selective are you in your applications? Like, are you only, do you, do you mostly only, like I didn't apply to that many jobs um, because I mostly applied through people I knew, you know, referrals or companies I had connections with. So in that case, it was a relatively high application to um, the first interview because, you know, like I had like a decent background and you know, I had the referrals, so that was pretty high versus if I'd applied to a bunch of companies online, cold applications, that would have been very low. Uh, so, you know, it really depends. And then it is helpful though, to analyze like, okay, what stages is there more drop off? Like if I'm applying to a bunch of places, maybe I'm trying with for, I'm trying these things. I'm not getting anything. Okay. Maybe I should talk to some people. Is it how I present myself on my resume? Is it that I'm applying to the wrong types of jobs? Like I, I, you know, it turns out like, oh, I'm applying to all these jobs that need that really, really want this formal degree that I don't have. Um, or no, I'm getting the hiring manager interviews and then I'm not going forward. Okay. You know, is, is what can I reflect on that part and so on and so forth. So I think that's sort of more helpful, but I would say I saw someone posting today who was laid off at Airbnb and they talked about their first data science job search versus their second and like those ratios. And I think they said like, it was either like 10 or 5% maybe of applications got them to the next stage. So if that's your case, like don't definitely that's not abnormal. Again, this person applied to, I think, like 130 companies. So if you're applying to that many companies, most of them are not going to get back to you if you don't have previous experience as a data scientist. OK, the next question is, how important is it to get object oriented programming concepts, data structures and algorithms to get a data scientist job? Eh. It depends. I'll be honest. I don't know. I vaguely remember things about object oriented program. I don't really need in my job because R is much more about functional programming, although you can use object oriented programming. So in my case, like I'm working, I got a job and I'm working as a data scientist and I don't have that. But so, you know, that being said, uh, you also mentioned, I think like algorithms and stuff. And if you're a machine learning engineer, for example, yes, it is important to know you know, like to, to know, like ON, right? Like the complexity of your algorithms so th because, you know, the speed's gonna really matter there. You know, they might ask you some sorting questions like, you know, bubble sort, like how did you make this thing? So it depends, but I, yeah, I would say object oriented, not necessarily. If it's specifically listed in the job description, it's probably worth brushing up on, but I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. The next question is, in terms of day-to-day -day work, what are the differences and similarities between the work a developer slash software engineer does versus what a data scientist does? Yeah. I mean, this really, like software engineering even of itself, like their day-to-day -day can look so different, right? You might know the terms like backend versus front-end engineer, like someone, you know, that the programming language that they use, it can be totally different, the types of problems. Um, but I would say in general, like, 
one thing that engineer much more common with engineering teams is to use uh, Jira or another like task management tool to have tickets and to really, really like scope down like, okay, this is like, first I'm gonna like do this part, then I'm gonna do this part of the project, then I'm gonna do this part. Cause there's a lot less uncertainty in most of software engineering. Like generally you're not worried like, can I even build this website? Like you may have uncertainty about how to build it, but you kind of know it can be done. Like someone, hopefully you can do it, but someone can do it. Versus in data science, like a predictive modeling project, like half the time you find out like, oh, the data's not there. We need to figure out the data or, oh, this data, like talk, tracking down the 20 people to figure out what this data means, like took three days. So that that's delay in the project or, oh, I made the model and it just, we, we can't, like it's trying to predict, you know, what's the next dice roll. Like even if you have a thousand data points on the past dice roll, you're never gonna be able to make a predictive algorithm that predicts the next one. Uh, so I do think like that's the uncertainty inherited in data science does change like some of the process. So some teams, some data scientist teams do use agile, do use the sprint, these two week systems um, or Jira tickets. But I would say not many more software engineering teams do. Uh, and again, like, I don't know, the, the jobs are similar and like, I don't, and you code, but um, otherwise I think they're, they're quite different in the types of problems that you're working on. Uh, the next question is, um, how real is the threat of jobs lost to automated machine learning tools, uh, aka AutoML? So, so this actually, um, I don't think, one, it's not very great because of what I said before, that like so much of the work is not like optimizing the, uh, you know, like which, which like machine learning algorithm I use. It's much about like, how do I get the data? What problems should we even be solving? How do I talk to people? How do I put this in production? So it can be, you know, like this algorithm needs to serve our customer service team. That's, and it's going to be hit, you know, 5 million times a week. Uh, so I would say not, not much. Uh, that being said, like, uh, I think, uh, I'm going to find it. Um, Eduardo de la Rubia had a great talk at our studio, which was not the worry that like ML teams are going to be replaced by auto ML, but actually that, the problem is uh, data scientists don't necessarily have much of a competitive advantage there. Um, and engineers could actually be the ones replacing these machine learning teams because, you know, they have a lot of the capabilities and they just have to get up to speed in the machine learning part. So that actually, I think, is the, the bigger worry. Right. There's also the critical thinking part of it, too, which is, yes. which is put on uh, data science. So um, the last question <laughs> is, um, as you know, only one job in a team is related to ML. So would you suggest picking up big data and cloud computing to break into the field? Yeah. So, if, uh, you know, that, so big data is tough because like SQL deals with big data, uh, you know, like Etsy stored like billions of events in our SQL database and I queried it and it worked very well. But um, for like even bigger data, we use uh, Scalding uh, to write uh, Hadoop jobs. Um, so that was how uh, Etsy did it. But another company may use Presto and another company may use Google BigQuery. Another company may use this. So I don't, the problem is like big data tools outside of SQL are so much more fractured. I don't think it's worth trying to learn, you know, all of them or even one of them because it may not be the useful one. But cloud computing, I think it's hard to learn on your own uh, cloud computing. I do think if it's something you're interested in, it's worth like playing around with AWS or other tools. Um, but that's also something you could pick up on the job. Um, and I, I certainly did. I hadn't worked with cloud computing at all. And then, uh, well, I guess in, in Etsy, actually all the servers were uh, in a server farm. We did not have Google Cloud when I was there, but then I moved to DataCamp. They used Redshift on AWS and I started picking that up. All right, so we have gone through all the questions. Thank you so much for staying good half hour past our <laughs> webinar. Um, do you, so one of the, the questions that I've seen, so this, this is being recorded, it'll be available. And also the slides will be made available on your website, is that right? Yes, also uh, thank you Artemis File also posted, there's an old version of it. Um, so if you go to my website right now under speaking, I gave, yeah, pretty much the same talk uh, in November. Um, and so you can find that. And then I'll also add the slides from this talk up tonight. Uh, and you can review them. 
Okay, great. Thank you so much um, for being here and your patience and answering all the questions. <laughs> I think it's a record number of questions we've had. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank thank you all for tuning in. I'm like, especially folks who you know came in in like the middle of the night or the morning or all these things. So I'm just like, you know, very happy. Uh, you know, feel free if you have. Uh, like I said, I, I will sort of plug my own advice again. Like, if you have more questions, like I think it is worth. I actually have a. Um, blog post on like getting a job in data science that I think is worth skimming. But if you do have like follow up questions, do feel free to reach out. Um, if you do it on LinkedIn, please add a message if you do, because I get a lot of LinkedIn requests from random people and I don't usually, I don't accept unless there's a message saying why they reached out um, or you can reach me on Twitter. All right. So um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, looking and uh, your book, you want to just uh, mention your book again? Yes. Uh, so if you like this, you like the book, um, you can find it at datasidecareer.com or <laughs> this is my uh, co-author short link, bestbook.cool. They link to the same place. Uh, so that's on Manning. It's also on Amazon, but at Manning, you have the discount code. So that's MTP umbrella 20. And I also saw someone said they found a better one, which great, use it, which is KD math 50. So I guess that's 50% off. Um, yeah. And uh, you can... You can get it there. If you get the physical book, it comes with the ebook, or you can just get the ebook. All right, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, for more Data Umbrella events, follow us on Meetup and you can see what is coming up. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for hosting. <laughs>